morning, everybody. Working? Fine? Right. Um, before I start, quick pun for new card. Um, the guy said I'm from the Cape, so when I fly home tonight, I need to pay for that parking. A new MV uh, new card works in the machine at the airport. The old one didn't, so I love the new MV card. All right, so that's another pun for it. Um, it actually works as a great tool for you for petty cash within your businesses. So not only about your customer, but you can use it within your, your own shop as a petty cash tool. All right, um, today I've been asked to speak about debit order abuse and compliance. At a stage I thought that Stefan and Rodney were gonna steal my presentation because I said the F word a few times, fraud, 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 okay? And you will find in the second part of my presentation, we are gonna speak about fraud quite a bit. And that's actually the part of my presentation I prefer the most um, because I've got a passion for it. It's a new thing for me. And we're actually going to have some practical examples that we're going to go and look at, okay? Including a video that's about three minutes long. So if you can just bear with us in that video. Okay, so to get started, let's talk about mandates, okay? When I say mandates, we're not talking about a debit check mandate. A debit check mandate, as Jean Galactic said in the beginning, is the electronic mandate that the bank owns, okay? We're talking about mandates as in the agreement between you and your customer, okay? Well, your customer gave you permission. Now, important to note there in the slide, I've got there written or voice. So irrespective of format of your mandate, there are seven critical requirements that you need to have in your mandate. The first one is your company name, okay? The second one is your abbreviated name. Now, your abbreviated name is the short name that we register for you at the bank, right? I'm gonna give a tip a little bit later regarding the abbreviated name. You'll see at the bottom of the slide over there, okay? Then you need your customer's initials and surname. Please, I recommend putting in all their initials. Um, I'll give you an example, but off the topic here, but I'm Jay Carstens and my wife is JC Carstens. And often when we go to clicks to get our medicine and stuff, okay, discovery gets them mixed up because the pharmacist uses only Jay Carstens instead of JC Carstens. And then my wife knows we use their medical aid, et cetera. All right, so it's very important that you use the full initials and the surname, okay? Next up, the bank account details for your customer. Please don't put only a few little digits of it. Ensure that you have the full bank account number. Because if anybody ever needs to check, you need to verify the full bank account number that the authorization was given on. Next up, installment date and installment value. Um, very important that you get this right. Um, in the previous discussion, we were speaking quite a bit about uh, disputes. Okay, so if you get that wrong, you open to disputes and reversals. Um, there were also some exciting things sent there, things that are coming up in the near future, which is gonna help you guys out there. And I think that the strike data analysis or tool that the guys showed is gonna be a great tool for you guys to also get your dates right and at the same time increase your success rates and have happy collections. Okay, last but not least, okay, the seventh item I got up there is explicit authority to debit the bank account. Now, a lot of people think that just simply, there's my seven well, six criteria and a signature at the bottom is enough. Okay, it's not sufficient. You need to have a clear written sentence there or verbally, if it's gonna be in a voice recording, um, where your customer says, I authorize you to debit my bank account as per the above six, okay? So you can play around with those words and put it into your own words, but there needs to be that clear instruction and that's where the word explicit comes from. Okay, right, any questions so far? Okay, on to the tips. Yeah, sorry. Mendes, in term, uh, instead of documentation being completed, is it possible that we can do it as per WhatsApp or online, or does a document? Because sometimes some of our clients doesn't, we're not able to come face to face with them, and we do online. Is it possible that we can do it online, where they just type in information okay. instead of completing it on a document? It, it can be done, but there are certain factors we need to take into consideration. And we're going to mention it now with one of the tips that I've got actually over here. Okay, and I'll jump straight to that. And I think Pierre might even touch on it. You need to ensure that that signature that you get is e-compliant. Okay, so just sending a normal WhatsApp is not going to work. Okay, they, um, it might be between, fine between you and your customer, but when it actually comes to going to, to the court or going to the banks, there are certain things that they're going to look for. Okay. Now, the banks are very fussy, and we're going to get to a bit later. They actually want to take out the signature that they got on file and compare it to what the customer's presented to you. Okay? 
Now, do you only got some electronic recording? It's very complicated. Okay. You can download, you know, they, they say there's an acrobat, whatever, where we can, you know, instead of them, because some of them, uh, they don't have access to, they end up having to go to a news cafe just to print the document, complete it, send it back. So what if we ask them to maybe download an app where they can, I send the mandate and they electronically yes, it and sign it. You're 100% correct. Will that work? You're 100% correct, but just make sure that that app is e sign compliant. It's what? e sign compliant. Okay. okay. You can, look, you get biometrics or signature pads where the person's going to do your handwriting, and then you're going to get your e-signature as well. You want to go? Where you, it doesn't look like an actual signature. It doesn't look like a scribble or anything like that. It's usually more of a type thing with a name or maybe even a fingerprint. Those type of things you need to make sure that are compliant, that it will stand up in court of law. Okay. Well, so I, I think Pierre is going to definitely touch on it, okay, in, in his presentation. So in the Delta systems, uh, Winfin and, and Delphin, do you do you use that? Fantastic. So there's an integrated uh, platform that you can use in that, which is called VoIP, Voice over IP. So there's voice recordings that you can do. You save that voice recording next to the mandate, and then you can actually use that. So there's a solution in that available for you. There's one minute of your presentation, Pierre. <laughs> All right. Back to the tips. Um, okay. The abbreviated name. As you guys know, your entity name, the name you have registered for your business, is not always the same as your trading name. Okay. So you might have Justin Carson's whatever, whatever, whatever. But at the end of the day, my shop sign says ABC Solutions. Okay, so what does your customer identify? They don't identify with Justin Carson's whatever, whatever, whatever. They identify with ABC Solutions. Okay, so speak to your account manager about does your abbreviated name speak to your customers? Because if you're going to put on there Justin Carson's whatever, whatever in an abbreviated format, there's a good chance that when there's a deduction from your customer's bank statement and they look at it, they're going to say, I don't recognize this name. And what they're going to do, they're going to try and reverse that transaction okay so i would recommend rather having your trading name or your shop name that is abbreviated instead of your actual entity name okay something that speaks to your customer um the next tip that i got is that your mandate does not need to be limited to the six criteria that i got up top before the explicit authority um you could put it into two pages if you wanted to i would highly recommend that you have clauses on how you handle pay dates when the payday falls on the weekend. Okay, and again, interesting what Stefan and I had to say early on before, and what you do in December. A lot of our customers say, if it's a term loan, in December, I will debit your account from maybe on the 15th and apply tracking to it. So your customer knows upfront how you're gonna handle their transactions. And if you are ever investigated by the bank or there's a request for a mandate, you can say, dear customer, I explained to you upfront, this is what I do on the regular 25th or if the 25th falls on the weekend, or what I'm gonna do with the 21st in the case of December, okay? It's about educating your customer at the same time as well. Um, we've got the, the East sign compliant part done. Uh, my next tip based on our future theme is integration is your friend. Why do all this by hand? Why take the time to, to write this all out when our systems can do it for you? So if you are a Dolphin or Webfin user, please make use of integration. Also at this time I would like to punt that we have got backup solutions. So speak to our companies about that as well. You don't want to be in a scenario where, let's say, a year down the line, we come to you and say, please give us a mandate for Justin Carstens, and now you've got to go and scratch in all your files. What if we can store that online for you somewhere? Okay, so speak to our team. Um, if you are unsure if your mandate meets the criteria, please do speak to your account managers. They will gladly sit with you and go through it. We also do have a sample mandate now, a sample mandate cannot be used as is. You can't just copy paste. Um, a sample mandate does need to be put onto your own letterhead. There are certain fields that you need to change to have your own wording, um, but the guys can assist you with that. Um, our sample mandates actually do have suggestions for weekends and December in the clauses that we have there. Right, questions? No. All right. So from time to time, you might be requested for a mandate. Now, this could be due to a routine check by the bank or a consumer complaint or the F word fraud, okay? 
the fraud part we'll speak about a bit later. Um, for now, we're going to speak about routine industry checks. Okay, I just want to grab some water. Okay, so routine industry checks. Um, we speak about high failure rates and high dispute rates. Um, the banks seem to have appetite for a 20% failure rate, anything greater than 20%, they seem to send our way for investigation. When it comes to dispute rates, um, they seem to tolerate up to 5%. Between 5% and 10%, uh, they get a bit nervous and they ask us to have a look, but they are willing to work with us. Anything greater than 10% for disputes um, is a big red flag for the, for the banks, and they ask us to have a proper look at those cases and it often kicks off um, quite extensive investigation. Um, the next thing we have there is where your installment values is greater than your average. Um, also take note of my tip at the bottom there. Um, so what I'm saying with this is maybe you are a micro lender and your typical transaction is 1,200 Rand, but all of a sudden you get this opportunity where somebody comes in and you can borrow them 35,000 Rand. That 35,000 Rand transaction is gonna stand out and it's gonna push your average up because your base is normally 1,200 Rand. Now the banks are keen, what is that spike? They wanna know what's going on there. Um, potential transaction splitting, I've actually got a slide on that next, uh, but that is when you would take a value and break up into smaller values for the same date, then high volumes of grid -run bank, high volumes of grid -run bank transactions on EFT, so EFT is our MPS product, okay? Now, for user, those of you who use our MPS product and we are in the microfinance space, you'll know that the EasyPay card, the green card, doesn't work on debit check. Okay, so you're kind of forced to go to the MPS route, which is EFT. So now what the banks now see is they see, okay, on this EFT profile, there's 99% only Greenwood Bank. And then they ask the question, why aren't we seeing Capitec? Why aren't we seeing APSA, et cetera, et cetera? And then they want to investigate. Another thing that causes them to investigate with the Greenwell Bank case is we found that uh, we've had some customers that when granting credit to the SASA um, grant recipients were using the balance in the bank account and not the actual grant value received on a monthly basis. So what we were all of a sudden seeing, you were seeing transactions for 50,000 Rand on the SASA um, grant recipients bank statement. And that was also then obviously pushing up your installment value, um, the average, and then leading to investigation. Um, the last one I got there, I find a little bit funny myself, odd, but I've had a few cases where they say to us, this customer's got 99% Capitec transactions. Please investigate. Um, what we have found though, okay, so we all know Capitec is the majority at this stage based on the LMSs that you are servicing. Uh, what we have found is it's smaller towns with these limited ATMs. Okay, and with those limited ATMs comes limited bank branches and it kind of leads to where the guys just prefer Capitec in that industry. Okay. Um, I've have had some challenges with that because you do find some retailers that have those sponsored by ATMs within the shop. So it's not necessarily true that there is only a Capitec ATM in that branch, but, the, but on industry level, the banks, they do look at it. Um, another one that I got actually over the weekend, I got a whole list from the bank to investigate over the weekend, um, which I have an add on here is they actually gave me the scenario of irregular growth patterns. So that's something we'll be looking at in the next few weeks. Okay. Um, the step that I've got here at the bottom is very important. We're gonna to touch on it a bit later again when we talk about the fraud, okay? Um, but I, I like to say, is it too good to be true? Okay, and then go back to my example. If you are a credit provider, typically doing 1,200 Rand, and you're authenticated by TT3, so on the terminal, and all of a sudden this opportunity presents for 35,000 Rand, 50,000 Rand, but the person can't give you a card, they're not in front of you, and they insist on doing a TT1 authentication via phone, is it actually legit, guys? Okay, don't just think, wow, this is a great opportunity, let me just go and do it. Actually sit down and have a think about it. All right, there's a certain amount of a risk associated with it. Can I just add something there, I'm, I'm sorry. So in, in terms of something to look out for you, guys, and this is very important, okay? If a person walks into your branch all of a sudden and he says to you, so uh, I want to take out credit with you, um, I don't have my card with me. But you can do a debit check, TT1 transaction, TT2 transaction, something. 
we see a lot of sim swaps starting to happen. I mean, you, you saw it in the previous uh, presentation from, from Stefan and them as well. Did, did you give details around that? Okay, so, cool. So, <laughs> so in terms of sim swap, what happens is people actually clone your sim card, my sim card, and then that person who's cloned my sim card puts his sim into his own phone and then he walks into your shop and he comes to take out credit. But now it's not the right person. It's a, it's a fraudster standing in front of you wanting to take credit. Um, he applies for credit. He gets approval and everything. You send the debit check transaction through to his phone, but it actually comes to the fraudster's phone, right? Um, more often than not, we find that those people are actually people that earn very good salaries and they're overseas, they're busy on business trips and that kind of thing. And then some person has got inside info and the inside track and we suspect, I mean, our suspicion is someone that knows what's going on in the bank account, knows that this person ordered foreign currency, knows that, um, who could that be? Um, I'm, I'm not allowed to say it, okay, but <laughs> there's a specific industry that works with that detail and data. Be very afraid when a person walks in and says, I don't have a card. Please only process against my team. Be very afraid. Check that thing out. We, we do have a, um, we've actually sourced a supplier that can give us access to do a call, like a web service call out of your system, through which you can check if there has been a SIM swap in the past 48 hours. Um, the challenge is that there's a lot of work behind that thing to build it to put it together etc cetera, etc cetera. and then there's a cost to do every single call and so forth so maybe a question to you guys by show of hands who would want us and staff please don't raise your hands um, <laughs> customers so who of you would want us to build something like that and make it available so that you can do a sim swap check yes yes okay um, so, so obviously, you know, for us, the investment behind that is about six months worth of development to get there. Um, that's the total duration, probably roughly, I'm, I'm guesstimating, um, to get this thing tested end to end and all of that and get it live and so forth. And then you can start running this test. But it, it is very, very important that you please be aware of that um, and be very careful and suspect when you find people saying stuff like that. Okay. And thank you, Vaughn, for putting to my latest slide. Oh my great. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back again, ladies and gents. We'll skip this one, it's towards the end. Um, all right, so we have here. Okay, transaction splitting. Okay. So, transaction splitting is when you take a value and you break into a smaller value, but still present it for the same date. Okay. Maybe you're concerned that your customer can't afford the full. Let's call it 3,000 Rand, so therefore you load 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, or maybe one and a half and one and a half. Okay. So, what is important to note is that transaction splitting is not allowed. Okay. And I want you guys to take a moment to read the Sports Regulatory Framework, Rule 7217. Take a moment to read that quickly. Okay. And that's basically what new pay or fintech is governed by, okay? So members are not allowed to split a transaction by processing more than one payment instruction in respect of an underlying commercial transaction. However, we had said, had scenarios, and this is now for our microfinance customers, we tend the microfinance for Africa sessions, where the NCR has been speakers at those sessions, and the NCR has given a view on this, okay? And I would like to reference um, two particular cases. Um, the one happened last year, around right about June, July, one of the webinars, and the lady from the NCR, she was asked a question about transaction splitting. And the example that she was given was that um, your customer walked in today and borrowed one and a half thousand rand. Four hours later, they came in again a second time and borrowed another one and a half thousand rand. And the question was, was that loan splitting? And the lady from the NCR said in her eyes, it was. Okay. However, she put big emphasis on the fact that regarding the fees, so the, the initiation fee and the service fees, the issue was not necessary that it was one and a half and one and a half. It was the case that you were going to charge one lot of fees for the first one and a half and a second lot of fees for the second one and a half. Okay. 
She was happy if you had split it, kind of, but only charged one lot of fees. Then she took it a step further and said that if your customer borrowed the one and a half today and came back tomorrow for the second one and a half, then it was not loan splitting. Then you could charge the second lot of fees because it was a different day. Okay. The other scenario that I want to speak about um, goes back a few years. Um, I think it was the case in one of the sessions in Durban. And a uh, customer said to the representative from the NCR, and it was a different representative from the NCR, um, I borrowed my customer 3,000 Rand and I loaded the transaction on 1,500 Rand and one, another one for 1,500 Rand, but I only charged them one lot of service fees and initiation fees. Is that okay? And the opinion in that case was it was okay because, again, they only charged the one lot of service um, fees. All right. So now you've got this conflict. The representatives of the NCR are saying, okay, you can do this transaction splitting as long as you're charging the one lot of fees. However, we just read here about the parcel framework that says you're not allowed to split transactions. Okay. And this is now the catch. If you take a moment to read the bottom clause from the National Credit Act, it says, if there's a conflict between a provision of the section and a provision of the National Payment System Act, then the provisions of that act prevail. So what that means basically in this context is that the positive regulatory framework overrules what the NCR is saying under these circumstances. Okay, so to get to the point, splitting of transactions is not allowed. Okay, and uh, we do regular exercises to try and identify potential cases like this. Um, and if we do find cases like this, our account managers will consult with you to see if there's any merit behind um, these splitting of transactions and I'll advise you on how to uh, mitigate this from doing the future. Yeah. Now, when we do do investigations for splitting of transactions, uh, we often find that customers cannot provide what we see then as all the mandates. Okay? And that's what this slide speaks to, okay? multiple transactions for single installment. Um, this could be when you do, a, for example, a term loan so let's say your customer's paying you over 12 months, right? So now we need to break this down a little bit further and we need to compare EFT, so our MPS product, to debit check, all right? So EFT MPS, as you guys know, it, is very simple, right? You can have one mandate and use that mandate either for a single instruction that you load on UPay or to load a transaction for January, another one for February, another one for March, another one for April, et cetera, for 12 month period, okay? We do recommend, however, that you at least have on your mandate that it is a recurring mandate or a mandate that you can use for 12 installments. Okay. In the debit check space, it's a little bit more complex because, as we said um, in Young Galatly's introduction, it is a, the debit check mandate is owned by the bank. Okay. And every time you do one of these debit check mandates at the bank, there are reference numbers. Okay. Now, you guys probably all know about the DCPRD number, for example, that shows on the bank statement. So normally you get the abbreviated name, the DCPRD, 000, and some other characters at the end. So example, that's one of the references the banks have. And the thing with this, with debit check, is that for each unique reference that you have for debit check, it needs to have its own mandate. Okay. So what I'm saying to you is that you cannot use one mandate and load an individual debit check for January, individual one for February, individual one for March. Okay. You would need to rather have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 mandates, so one per month, or make use of the functionality that we offer you guys, and I've got a little screen slip on our screen there, where you could say to us, load me a debit check mandate, but please upload it for a recurring, or a term, as I've got an example there, of 12. Okay. And we know then to look, present that mandate for you to the bank for the next 12 months. Okay, questions? Hi everyone. How's it? My name is Tolani. Uh, I just want to ask if, uh, let me say, the client is getting paid on the 25th. Yeah. Uh, that client is taking a loan of six months. Now the paying date, uh, sometimes the 25th is falling over the weekend. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, now we need to swipe that client for 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 the 23rd, the Friday. So the first month, the 25th was on the right date. The second month, the 25th is falling over the weekend. As you said, 
we are not allowed to swipe. Uh, uh, we are not allowed to to split the the payments. So, is it possible to swipe those payments in a in the same day? Okay. So, if you organize split it in the yeah. debit scenario, okay, yeah. you organize different references to the bank, so you would need a mainnet for each. Okay. Yes. If you are going to use uh, where you're loading for term on the new post structure, uh, you could potentially have um, challenges with the bank because the, as per the debit check rules, as it currently is, anything for a weekend needs to go to the Monday. So changing anything to the Friday is against the is against the debit check rules at this stage. That is why it is so critical what um, Stefan and Rodney were speaking about, the upcoming developments where debit check will recognize that if the payday does fall on a weekend, that the Friday is a valid day. And therefore you could load it as we have it day 12 and not have the scenario now where you have to go and do individual ones. Thank you. Uh, maybe just a different take on that as well, okay? So if, if you have a, a contract for six months and your contract, your mandate that you've got says that you're going to debit X amount for the following six months against this person's account with all of these details, blah, 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 within all of the confines and all of the rules and regulations. And you have six transactions, one for each month. Justin, that wouldn't be seen as splitting, would it? That is six different transactions on six different months on six different dates. Now, we don't like you to do that. Very honestly, we don't, okay? Because every time you swipe the card, we pay for it. You don't, but we do. <laughs> so it becomes very expensive for us, but I understand why you're doing it. So once this regulation or the, not regulation, the, the fix of the system, I call it a fix because I think it's a flaw in the system to roll forward at the moment. Once the data adjustment rule gets implemented, whereby you can move back, the weekend minus one that we had in ADA, right? So that thing, when it moves back to the prior working day, when that gets implemented, you won't need to do that anymore because we will need the we will move the transaction back to the prior working day the second that the banks allow us to do that. Good morning, everybody. My name is Leon. Hello. So if I can maybe make a suggestion in in our industry, what we do is. For, for example, you will debit your client on the 25th. Maybe put something, a mandate in place for the futures to start tracking those clients two, three days prior to the 25th. By doing that, you will cover him if he's on a Sunday or a Saturday, and you start tracking his account in case he gets the money on the Friday up until, for example, the Monday or the Tuesday. So you covered for that period for the whole of the six months. So that's just a suggestion that might help. Yeah, your mandate yeah. date would need to indicate that earlier date, though. Yeah. Your mandate, not scenario, your mandate date wouldn't be the 25th, but then you could do the 23rd. But you're 100% about right, using the functionality of the system to, to your best benefit. And by the way, we, we, we actually have a functionality in our system whereby when you swipe for the 25th, you can tell us to automatically move that back by one day, two days, three days, and then add more tracking and present the transaction as such. Exactly in that manner. So we can do that for you automatically. Sorry? Yes. Okay. All right. So what happens? In the circumstances that we do request, uh, did it get louder or was some mandate from you? Um, so typically, unless otherwise stated, you have five working days um, to present the mandate to us. Um, depending on from what channel that investigation came, uh, that mandate could be shared with other stakeholders, for example, the banks. Um, in certain cases, the, the debtor, your customer, could be contacted as well to say, are you aware of this, is your signature, et cetera. Okay. Um, let's say now, we find some shortcomings, okay? So maybe one of the seven criteria that I mentioned is not there, okay? So typically what we'll do is we'll give you 30 days to go and correct that, and then after 30 days we'll review again, okay? If we find any major shortcomings, 
um, you could be suspended and you could be also be exited. Okay, that's worst case scenario. So particularly what happens with the suspension could be two items. One, uh, we retain all funds. So in other words, we don't settle to you until the investigation is completed. And the second scenario would be that we prevent you from uploading new transactions into the system until the investigation is completed. Okay. So it's very important that you have your mandates correct and in place and you stick to the deadlines given. Okay. Broad. Okay, so now we get to the F word. Um, I particularly don't like using fraud when I speak to people, the word. Um, some people take it wrong. They always straight away go on the defensive on the back foot thinking, okay, you make an accusation about me, then I'm committing the fraud. Okay. That's not correct. Okay. Because the fact of the matter is you do get merchant fraud where our customer might be involved in the fraud, but you get a lot of application fraud happening. And that's actually what was alluded to in Stephen and Roger's presentation. Okay. Application fraud is a reality, people. Okay. And what we're going to do now is we're going to play a video. It's from a um, SABC expose from, I think, 2018. And you're going to see how just easy and cheap it was to obtain certain documentation okay, to assist a fraudster in committing application fraud. Okay, so enjoy. At this internet cafe in Yeovil, Johannesburg, Forged payslips and bank statements are just a print away. I'm telling you, we meet you. this man who tells us about someone who can make things happen for us. Any way you like it, all of this you open, anybody you ask him, his name is Kalis, you say Rasta Mo. Nobody to be called him. There's nothing. He's <laughs> a grandmaster. So we meet Kahiso, known as Rasta and ask him if he can provide the documents. I need a um, three-month statement yeah. and a payslip. And which bank should I use for? Which bank can you use? Use Capitec. Capitec, Capitec, yeah. Is Capitec better? Yeah, it's better. You can use as many companies as possible, like, you know. It's Capitec. How much? Mm -hmm. Confirmation is 200 on this one. Yeah. And the other thing? Yeah, uh, the bank statement is 200. The pay slips is 100 bucks each on original paper. Rasta gets down to fabricating a tailor made pay slip and bank statements. He's a busy man, inundated by clients, and after about 30 to 45 minutes, this is what we get for 600 rands. The pay slip with a randomly chosen name and surname that we provided. The ID number of an unknown person working for a company that Rasta chose in a position of our choice, earning this amount. And three months bank statements with what appears to be the official stamp of one of the big banks. So we tested the number on the pay slip to confirm if our non-existent employee works at the stated company. Hello? Hello? Uh, you still there? Yes. Yeah, thank you for holding. Um, let me check on the system. Amanda, let me get up. All right, wait. Uh, yes, ma'am. Amanda Ngela is our senior supervisor. Okay, and what uh, is her date of engagement with you? Uh, the date of engagement is the 17th of uh, July 2016. Oh, all right. All right. Um, you said uh, Amanda is a senior supervisor with you? Yes, ma'am. And surprising, the bogus company confirms a bogus employee. And that opens the door to a world of credit, ramping up debt of thousands or even millions of rand, and no one can trace you. Chriselda Lewis, SABC News in Johannesburg. All right, so if we didn't start late, we would have paused and reflected on that. But moving on, unless you've got questions. <laughs> 
Um, just by the way, credit to the journalist. And yeah. Alisa. Alisa. Just a quick one. Um, with this fraud, because I know with WebFin that I'm currently using, obviously when you put an ID number, it will tell you, because it's linked with Home Affairs, it will tell you that this ID number does not match maybe this name or the surname and so forth. So I want to find out if this could be successful, if it was successful, if somebody applied for a loan. How is that unless maybe they are using different system or maybe there is a flaws in the WebFin system that maybe we're not aware of? Because I, I know for a fact that if you put an ID number on WebFin, like you put a different name, it will automatically reject because it's linked with Home Affairs. So if this one could be successful, I'm not sure if the Amanda does exist in terms of the ID number and the name because forgery, I understand it can be there, but authentication, that's what. Is there any maybe a loophole that we should be aware of in terms of um, maybe our systems that we currently have or using, uh, especially WebFin? Because I know we had a group that we had uh, previously where people submitting fake bank statement but using their original names and so forth, just the changement. I think that system that we're using, it was called Met meta something like that you can upload that bank statement to verify with a certain institution to say that this uh, a statement is it original or it's not original because it runs through their database so my question is with um ultron uh, fintech or the new pay or the web fin is there a loophole that we should be aware of that if let's say right now a customer comes and they give me their id documents if i enter that particular id document before i can search anything is there any loophole that we should be aware of and say, if I enter this person's ID number, is there a possibility that it can run or it can accept and say that you can load this particular client on the system using this fake information? Okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I can maybe answer that. The current WebFin only makes use of an algorithm to validate the format of the ID number. It does not interact with home affairs. However, that being said, I am going to talk a little bit about development on that, and then I'll uh, explain a little bit more of that. There, there is some improvements coming in that space. Okay. Um, you also mentioned some of our, I think, choose cards done. Gonna, we're also going to speak about this quickly. Um, all right, so that's the video done. Okay, what they didn't touch on in that video there was ID documents. Um, so now these are some real case scenarios that we've had in the last six months that I've worked with. Um, all three of these, besides the obvious, we have crossed out part of the ID number in each, um, are fake. Okay, it's been confirmed by the banks uh, and their customer that they are fake. In all three cases, the photo is incorrect, first of all. Okay, so that's not the person who owns the bank account or the person who owns the ID number. Okay, now. Some of the things that we look at when we look at the ID books, and I'm no expert at this stage on this, it's a learning curve for me as well. Um, but as you start looking at things over and over, it stands out. So the first thing is if we look at Mrs. Lecky over here, note how the white next to the ID is all the way to the left, but with the two gentlemen, it's more in line with their names, which is more, this is more like a genuine ID book. Okay. So you can see that whole thing's been pasted over. Um, another thing you can look at, but you've got to bear in mind now, is that your ID book normally has that plastic sleeve around it. If we look at Mr. Osman, um, you can see there's a clear line over here. Okay. But when you look at it a better, you might say that's the plastic, but when you actually have a look at a better copy of this, you can see there's a contrast in different whites, where you can see that the, the white with the ID piece has been pasted over the original white. Okay. Um, another thing we can look at is um, if we look, oh, sorry, wrong button. Wrong button. The alignment, if we look over there, where the roundness starts, and over there, typically it lines up with the white. Okay, so what happens is in this case over here, you can see that the white is already into the roundness part over there. Um, Something that I haven't got much knowledge on this state, um, the stage of my experience with this stuff is also what the banks look at is the, um, the font used okay, to identify. So if we look at Mrs. Lecky, for example, there's a bit of a space between the letters, but if you look at Mr. Osman, Mr. Osman is very squashed up. Okay? Um, they also look at the shading, 
you know, the lines doesn't match up around where the pitch is getting put in place. I also received a case last week where um, that dot over there between I and the D is not present. So, so those are all type of things that you can look for. All right, um, got another two examples. Okay, so this first one on our left here, Mr. Vandenberg, um, he is, you can see his um, ID card. In fact, he's in the UK and doesn't even have an ID card. He's still got the old green ID book. Um, what the banks picked up with this one was, when they scanned the barcode at the back, it did not match up to the ID number of Mr. Vandenberg. Okay. Um, this one over here on the right, if the lady is a passport, and straight away what jumps out at you is that bird, they say it's a parrot, <laughs> over her face, okay? So that's a alarm bell straight away, okay? Your photo and your document is meant to be there so people can verify when they're standing in front of you, is this you, okay? So you, it should not be intrude, covered, whatever you wanna call it, all right? And quite clever, they got it over there and over there, they got the parrot, okay? So they, <laughs> yeah, but you, here's the sad part, and this is reality six in. This passport did the rounds at new pay customers. More than one new pay customer was impacted by this passport. Truth. And, and Justin, I see Mr. Van der Berg. Um, I don't know what what sex that is R. I mean, it shouldn't be male or female. What is R? <laughs> He's asking. Sorry? He's asking. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, so interesting enough, I actually have some training uh, scheduled with the NetBank guys for the, um, towards the end of March, where they're going to show me some of the things that they do to uh, identify if it is a fraud, um, fraudulent ID, etc. cetera. Um, they can show me the type of scanners that they use. A lot of these scanners are things that you can just download from the App Store. Okay. Um, however, what one scanner works on the one doesn't work on the other one. Okay, so you just got to be, you got to learn the different type of scanners. Um, I am going to explore the opportunities with those guys to see if that's something we could offer to you guys via a webinar experience. So we can educate our customers as well to empower you guys to be able to mitigate this risk. Okay, next slide. Um, gentlemen in the yellow, this is what you were speaking about. The second point over there. Okay, so we don't need to touch on that now. We already spoke about that, Pierre jumped in. Um, the first point that we got there is also the, on the new pay side. Again, um, we would have to check on the new pay side. Um, those who use my client, those who are using TT1, those who use NATO back in the day, those who are using AVS, when you type in the ID number, it needs to be the correct length. There's also certain algorithms that we use to see if the structure of the ID number is correct. Okay. Um, Pierre, I think I don't want to steal the limelight, but it sounds like you're going to speak about the next one where we're going to, in future developments, have the photo from Momo Fair, so let's leave that one for Pierre. But that would be great if you could see who's standing in front of you or what ID book you got. Is this the right thing? Okay. Some cards for fraud, we spoke about that. Thanks, Vaughan. Okay, fraud investigations, very similar to what we said earlier on with the routine investigations. However, I emphasize that you rather don't wait the five days to present the mandates to us. Because at the end of the day, we might be in a scenario where the bank says to us, this is fraud, guys, hold the money back. So numbers don't release the money to you. All right. So the sooner you play along with us, the better. Um, in the case of a fraud investigation, there's a big emphasis on us to convince the bank that it was application fraud and not merchant fraud. Okay? So we need to convince the banks that somebody came in there and the false pretenses took credit from you or applied for your services. And... The banks are kind of lenient. If it happens once, they're prepared to work with us and maintain you as a customer. But the moment it happens two, three times, the banks are very hesitant because at the end of the day, it's also the bank that is sponsoring you into the national payment system. And they have to stand up in front of all the other banks and powers of the bank, Zerbank, Bank, and say, okay, why did you allow this guy access to the platforms where this fraud was committed? Okay. Um, so please, if you are ever investigated for fraud, it's very important that you supply as much information as possible to basically prove your innocence, okay? So what I mean by as much information as possible, don't just give the mandate. Say, maybe I've got an ID copy on file of the guy that came in. Give the ID copy, because then the bank can see, okay, but whoa, this is not the right person. 
uh, immediately that data is shifted to application fraud. Right. Um, if you have any uh, proof of address, bank statements, get that through, then the bank can see, okay, what of this stuff has been forged or not. Okay, and again, that information can be shared with industry, so be very careful of that. It's, it's not easy just to say, okay, fraud is committed within the new pay space, let me just move on to the next service provider, because the banks do speak to each other. Okay, so in closing, speak to your account manager, very important. Okay, I was a account manager for 20 years, so I can relate to these type of conversations the guys have. Um, second, embrace technology. Okay, the system functionality we spoke about, the integration, the storage, the backup facilities that we have. Okay, make use of TT3, these prevention tools that we want to introduce. Ask the account managers, when's it coming? When's it coming? How can I use it? Okay, and then please embrace technology. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>